Well, thanks everybody for uh, for being here. Uh, so I'm I'm going to present without slides because the thing is the uh, that the speakers I really admire they have this thing that they never use slides, right? And the problem is that if I use slides, there's, I mean, there's so much to talk about and there's so much to share on what's happening right now. And, you know, I'll, we're kind of in the middle of that. So then if I have a slide, then I always, you know, lose my train of thought and I click the next slide and I have no idea what I need to talk about. So it's actually easier for me to just share the story, right? So um, I've, been, I've been working in or with machine learning since uh, 2015. Then is when uh, my journey started. I was just working as a uh, as a uh, as a software engineer, like most people are, and um, I started with um, uh, with text embeddings. I just for me just to get an understanding. Are people familiar with what text embeddings are? Does that like I see some hands, couple hands? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So for those who are not reading that, so um, the concept is actually um, it, it's it's quite straightforward. So uh, if you take a sentence of uh, words, or like, for example, if you think about the Wikipedia page or those kind of things, if you just, or a book that you can think of, then the idea basically is that the words, they have a relation to each other where they are uh, in the sentence or in the text or those kind of things, right? So, for example, if you, um, if you have an article about uh, a dog, like a Wikipedia, you know, article about a dog, the dog likes to, you know, chew a bone, so chances are that if you also take the page of a cat, that the word bone is not even in there, right? So the relation between the word dog and the relation between the word um, a bone is like there's a greater relation that there's between the word dog and cat. But maybe, uh, sorry, um, a cat and bone. But if you take the words dog and you take the words um, cat, then maybe you might find them in both articles because um, uh, there's like animals, you know, we, we you know, domestic, uh, domestic animals that we, that we have. So that's how you start to create relations between words and you can map out those relations. And the way to map out those relations is by doing that in space. So you can place these words in space. So if you think about a three-dimensional space, like where we are here right now, so I could take the word dog, I could take the word cat, and then I place the word bone closer to dog, then I place it to cat. So if I take the word bone, and I say, like, what's closest in this space? Then I might find the word dog, and I might find the word cat. And that is these, um, these geographical representations that we give to them, and that's what we call the embeddings. So an embedding and the word vector, and if you work in machine learning or AI, you will see that word a lot. It pops up a lot, a lot, a lot. Is uh, that representation that comes out of the, the model. And uh, you don't need a model to do that. The problem is that if you just brute force calculate that, it becomes tremendously expensive to, um, to calculate it. So you can predict what these distances are, and that's what these models do. They also don't do it in two or three dimensions. They do it in ranging from 90 to you know, uh, 1,500, sometimes even 12,000 dimensions. So the idea here is like the more dimensions you have, the more context you can capture. Right, so if you just think about it, if we would plot this idea with the dog, the bone, and the cat on two-dimensional space, then if I add a third dimension, there's like I can leave more information in three dimensions than I can leave in two dimensions. So, for example, if you think about a, uh, a supermarket, to make that uh, point of view, so if I have a 2D representation of a supermarket, and I say like, you know, where's the uh, the spaghetti or you know certain a type of spaghetti brand that you want to buy, then if you look at a 2D map, you know exactly where to go, where to walk, but then you still don't know at what height it is. So if you now add a third dimension to, all to, uh, to this, then we can say, well, is this on the X axis and the Y axis in the supermarket? But there's also like a Z axis, right? So we can go up and down, and then we know where the spaghetti is. All these vectorization models, um, that's what they do, right? So um, and they started with these word, um, uh, as these word embeddings, and that is also kind of where my journey started, because uh, you could do calculations with these words, and the, the thing that I was working on back then that was, um, we were looking at things you could do with like publications and articles and those kind of things, and one thing that we thought about was like, well, if I take all these words out of a sentence and I group them together, then I can create a center 
of point, like a central point, this so-called centroid, inside that space. So now if you take that bag of words, calculate that centroid, I can store that information in space. And I can say, now this document of this bag of words is stored somewhere in space. And it was very nice, because one of the things that we could do then was something that nowadays is called semantic search. Um, so what that practically uh, entails was that before we had semantic search, if I stored a document, for example, that where I would say um, the Big Ben is in London, right? then the only way to retrieve that information in the app that I was building was that I had to search for Big Ben or London. Right? I needed to do a keyword match. But now, all of a sudden, by representing those words, the Big Ben is in London in that space, I could have a search query like um, um, landmarks, in uh, landmarks in the UK, and then would calculate that centroid, and then it says, like, I don't have an exact match on that, but in that space, nearby your query landmarks in the UK, I have a data object that says, like, the Big Ben is in London. So that's how these vector databases were born. Because the uh, idea was that like databases that we use today to store information and search for information, um, they didn't have that data type, that vector data type. So a vector database, like Weave 8, what we're working on, is specifically focusing on that. So we open sourced that technology. People started to play around with this. And you know, the results were you know, OK-ish. You know, it was nice. It was fun. It was just an open source project. And then there was a paper released into the world um, where the, um, the architecture of transformers were introduced. And out of transformers, we got uh, sentence embeddings. So now the things that we did for words was actually happening on a sentence level. And now all of a sudden, the quality went up like crazy of these results. Right? It was significantly better. And two things in my mind clicked together, because a couple years before that, I was at um, uh, at uh, uh, Google I.O., the, the, the developer conference. And there, the CEO of um, Google said, like in 2016, he said, like, we're going to move from mobile first to AI first. I was like, ah, I think I know what they're doing. They're using these embeddings to vectorize these web pages, to search through them. And, that was, and then I thought, like, if we have a database that everybody can use, right, and later combine it with these sentence embeddings, then people can build their own semantic search systems. And that was by the end of uh, last year. So, you know, the beginning of uh, Q4 last year. That was what people were doing. They were building better search systems, right? So if you needed search, not only, by the way, text could also be images and those kind of things. And that was like a, that was just fascinating. So downloads went up, the user community started to grow because we were like, whoa, this is amazing. We now can build semantic search or uh, similarity search um, solutions. And then all of a sudden, we got a, um, a Slack message from a company that we were, they were kind of you know, working together with, that we're partnering with, because it's a company that's uh, selling these kind of models, right? And these vector embeddings. They sell these vector embeddings that we store. And they sent us a Slack message. And they said, like, yeah, we're going to release something new you know, tomorrow. And um, you know, let's see what happens, maybe. You know, we'll just release it tomorrow. We'll see what happens. And, and we were like, okay, hey, cool, good luck, you know, whatever you're releasing. And so the next day they released that thing, and the thing that they released uh, was called ChatGPT. And all of a sudden, every metric went up. Because what started to happen was now we did not only have like the use case for search with these embeddings, but we also the use case started to emerge to generate stuff. Right? Because if you generate stuff, if you generate data, based if you, if you ever use like a generative model and you ask it a question, then it, it returns a response. But there's like one huge big problem that you have with these models. Right? They're trained on real world data. And well, I wouldn't say problem, it's more a challenge. Right? They're, they're trained on um, uh, um, real world um, uh, data. So that means, and everybody who uses such a model knows this, you ask it a question. And it, might, it may, might give you, well, four responses. It gives you the correct response. It gives you a BS response, i.e., it's hallucinating. Or it says, hey, listen, I'm trained in 2021. I don't know. Or it says, I don't have access to this kind of information. 
So now you had this interesting situation where you had these generative models and these vectorization models. And the question was like, what can we do, right? How can we update that generative model to make it real time? So the thing back then was like, can we fine tune it, right? Because it's open, we can fine tune it, right? So, but the problem with fine tuning is it's expensive. It takes a long time to optimize, uh, to, to, to train. So I mean, nothing comparison to the base model, but still fine tuning is expensive. Is there another way how we can do that? And then the thing was, well, you can use these vector embeddings to have a semantic search question. You can have a bunch of results, and you can pipe these results into the model. That's actually a technique, and the technique is called retrieval augmented generation, or RAG in short. Turned out that databases like we were making, we were were surprisingly good at doing that. So now the second use case started to emerge, right? So this was early this year where people started to say, <clears throat> hey, actually, we can use the database, the vector database, we've, in combination with one of these generative models. We search through, we index our own data, we vectorize the data, we search through it, and we store that in the generative model. So now you see that companies, users, startups, they start to build these generative uh, um, applications. But by combining the vector database with the model, they can do that real time on their own data. So it was the second use case that emerged. But now the thing is so, um, and that's like what's in the, in, the, in, the, in the title of this talk, is that we talk about like stateless models, right? And what I mean with stateless AI is that, uh, that these models, they are inherently stateless, right? So a database, a database is a, a stateful application. So if you use a database and you store information in the database and two days later you query it, you hope that the data is still there. If it's not, it's a shitty database, right? So that's what is a stateful, or if you use Excel, right? If you fill something in an Excel and you have a bunch of formulas and you open the sheet two days later, you hope that the formulas are still in there with the same numbers, right? Otherwise, it's like a a shitty application, but that's the thing is like a, that makes it stateful. But the thing is that a machine learning model is stateless, right? So it just is. So um, what, what other things that just are in the digital domain are things like MP3 files, right? So an MP3 file just is. It doesn't contain any state. So if I listen to something and I share it with you, we can both enjoy the music, but the thing is like it doesn't change. You don't hear anything else than I do. So what these vector databases started to do, they made the AI stateful, right? Because now real time you could get information, you could interact with these stateless models, and the model just got that information from uh, the database. So think about anything that you want the model to know. So now we were not interested in the model anymore for its knowledge representation um, and uh, its language understanding. Just language understanding for now is enough because the, the model knows, hey, we need to request something from the database. And a lot of work is happening there right now where we basically weaving the database and the models together. So you get these applications, the, what we call AI native applications, where everything grows together. But then we started to think about, yeah, okay, that's all nice and fun. We now have two great use cases. So by the end of last year, we had semantic search and similarity search. And then, you know, around Q2 this year, the whole retrieval augmented generation uh, um, uh, uh, started to emerge. So basically that we made the generative model stateful, combining the database with the models. But then the question was like, what's next? Right? So because the thing is, this is all great and fun, but kind of we still sit in this domain of where we always been, right? Like since... You know, the, um, I think the, you know, I think AI itself and the internet before that, but is there something really new happening in how we're building applications? Is there something really different than how we use traditional SQL databases or how we use like NoSQL databases? Is this just another one where we just use these models or is something new happening? So what's happening right now related to that is that we started to ask, well, if you have data from a database, and if you pipe that to a generative model and you get a re result, why not just store that information back into the database? Why not ask the model to do operations on your data? 
So one thing that we released is something that we call generative feedback loops. And this is, by the way, everything that I'm sharing is like open source, so you can just find it on the, uh, on the website. So what the generative feedback loop does, and the example that we have is with, uh, with, with Airbnb listings, is basically we have a lot of Airbnb listings stored in the, in the vector database, but they don't have a description, or they have an insufficient description. So what we do is that we basically use the generative model to query the database, we say every time you find an insufficient or, inc or missing description, generate a description based on the data that we have and store that back in the database and give it a vector embedding. So you start with just a very sparse set of information like listings, a price, a host, and those kind of things. But while, when the system is done by creating these, um, uh, uh, these, these um, Airbnb listings, you can query like, I'm looking for a nice place in New York where I can walk my dog. And now all of a sudden, based on data that was not in your original data set, it's actually able to find that information. But then we're not there yet, right? So now we can also say, well, uh, for this listing, let's generate a couple of Facebook ads, right? For like a solo traveler, for a, uh, um, a couple traveling, an elderly couple traveling, and then we store that back into the database. So this is what we call generative feedback loops, and that's where we are right now. So we're now at a point where these systems start to become like really autonomous, if you will, right? You can give, just give a bunch of data to your database, in this case a vector database that's married together with these vectorization models in combination with these um, um, uh, generative models. And you can just give an instruction to your database. Right? You can say, hey, you're, you're filled with, I don't know, retail data, but some of the descriptions are very sparse or they're not really good. Fix that for me. Right? Oh, we have like an English data set, but we also want to sell this in, Fran in, in France. Can you also make French descriptions for this, please? Right? Or you can ask it a question. How many, um, uh, what, what, what product did we sell the most in Q2? And then the model generates queries, starts querying, receives these results, and generates an output. That's what we call the generative feedback loops. So that's also why my argument is like the vector database is doing something completely new. It's not SQL. It's not NoSQL. It's what we call AI native. It is marrying. It's, yeah, it's what we call like weaving, yeah, weave eight, no, weaving the model and the database together to create fully autonomous systems that you can interact with. Right? You can you can give it a prompt, go home, and when you come back to work the next day. You just have a completely different data set, a better data set, more data, updated data. Maybe sometimes it even deletes data for you, or replaces data, all these kind of things. And that is something that I'm extremely um, um, uh, excited about because recently somebody asked me, so but where's this, where do I think this is going, right? Because what I'm now saying is like, I'm not saying anything new. This is like now. So if you open your laptop, you can do this right now, right? So you can go to our website, you can download the database, the models, start working with it. But then the question is, um, what's next? And you might notice, probably during this conference, a lot of people talk about the LLMs, the large language models, right? And uh, those are great. And, uh, but actually, what I'm more interested in is in the multimodal models. Because a lot of work is actually happening right now, both in factorization models and in generative models, where the output of the model is not, per se, text. So the output can be text, it can be an image, it can be audio, it can be heat map, all these kind of things. So you give it a prompt, and you ask it to output something. So for example, you could have a product description, and you say, okay, generate a, based on this text, generate an image for me. Or based on this image, generate audio for me, right? That's actually happening. And then, like, I think maybe one and a half months ago, or two months ago, somebody shared a, a video with me, and um, I'm not sure if, if, if you guys seen it. It was, like, kind of popular on social media. It's this, um, uh, this, this Wes Anderson adoption of Star Wars. Have you, have you guys seen that? I see a few, a few yes. Uh, so there's, like, for those who, and a few know, so, so there's, like, this famous movie director, Wes Anderson, and he has this very specific style with these pastiche colors, right? And somebody created a trailer which is like, this is Wes Anderson's adoption of Star Wars, right? So it's in the colors of Wes Anderson, it's in his, in his style, it has his humor, it has his sound and those kind of things. 
But the little thing in the description uh, that it said was like, this video was completely generated with AI. Right? And now a lot of work went into that, because the, um, the, the, the creator of that video, right, they, they needed to probably copy paste stuff together. They needed to did something in, I don't know, Final Cut to make it look nice and those kind of things. But that's just operational stuff, right? So what we see right now, what's happening with these multimodal models in combination with these vector databases, is that I foresee, not in the too distant future, that we start to generate audio, images, and maybe even text with these kind of models. Text is tricky, but text with these kind of models, right? Where we're basically saying, like, hey, now we can create videos. So that might practically mean that the impact of this technology, a very pragmatic example, is that you might have a Netflix subscription. We might watch the same series. But based on series that I've watched in the past and that you've watched in the past, every episode is generated a little bit differently. Right? And the technology to do that is, as I mentioned, it's already here. I mean, we just still need to do stuff like very operational stuff, right? like scalability and that kind of stuff. Um, uh, the models, the multimodal models, need to be trained a bit further. But for the rest, we're kind of here already, right? So it's very important for you, assuming that the majority of you are makers, are creators, right? So you might, in your, in your company, you might create applications where you use ML or AI, or you might have a bis your own startup where you're doing that. Maybe you work for an enterprise where you're doing that. The tools are already here. So the tools to build these kind of things already, you don't, have to, um, you don't have to wait. You could go home after this talk, because you know, just then you've seen my talk, so that's good, right? You could go home, open your laptop, and start building this. Isn't that amazing? And that's just that combination. So you use, so we have a, a vector database that makes the model stateful. You have the models, and in the previous talk, we talked about open source models. You have proprietary models, whatever you want, whatever you like, whatever works for you. And you can now start to create these AI native applications yourself. So I'm almost at time. So thank you so much for listening, and enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>